And turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20. We'll begin reading in verse number 9. Go down through verse 19. Luke chapter 20, beginning in verse number 9. <clears throat> and then began he to speak to the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and led it forth to husbandmen and went into a far country for a long time. And at the season, he sent a servant to the husbandmen that they should give him the fruit of the vineyard. But the husbandmen beat him and sent him away empty. And again, he sent another servant, and they beat him also and entreated him shamefully and sent him away empty. And again, he sent a third, and they wounded him also and cast him out. But then said to the Lord of the vineyard, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be they will reverence him when they see him. But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. And so they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do to them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. And he beheld them and said, What is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And the chief priests and the scribes, the same hour, sought to lay hands on him, and they feared the people, for they perceived that he had spoken this parable against them. Heavenly Father, we come to your holy word once again to be fed with the truth that is from heaven, and we ask that you would humble our hearts before you, that we might Receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save our souls. Father, I ask for clarity this morning. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Well, chapter 20 of the Gospel of Luke has initiated a, a string of interactions between Jesus and the Jewish leaders. These interactions that carry on through chapter 20 indeed will become ultimately the catalysts that will continue to escalate until Jesus is killed, crucified by these men. The representative group uh, of the powerful Sanhedrin have been sent on a mission to undermine Jesus' authority, but instead of undermining his authority, they only served to uh, fall themselves into the clutches of the trap that they had set for Jesus. And Jesus confronted these leaders in their idolatrous hearts and really presented before them two options. You can submit to the truth, submit to Jesus and his authority, or continue to hold fast to their idolatry. As we saw last week, they chose the latter, and as a result incurred the judgment that Jesus gave them of a non-answer to their question, uh, and followed with this parable that was directed specifically at them. And so it's through this parable that we arrive in our study of the Gospel of Luke this morning, and Luke has placed this parable following this issue over authority. Remember, Jesus is teaching in the temple. He has arrived, he's cleansed the temple, and he is now teaching uh, and going over 
uh, the gospel with those who would listen to him in the temple, and the leaders have interrupted him in his teaching uh, and sought to call into question what he is doing and teaching. Uh, And now Jesus uh, begins to tell this parable that they recognize that it's against them, as verse 19 indicates, towards them. And the parable itself covers uh, the history of the nation of Israel. The overall message of this parable is not hard to understand. It deals with the disobedience of Israel uh, to the God who has called them out of the nations to walk in his truth. And Jesus uses an illustration to talk about this, and that's of a vineyard. Uh, The vineyard is a common analogy in the Old Testament, uh, and the writers of the Old Testament use it in a variety of different ways. The vineyard that uh, could be a sign of blessing, if uh, planting a vineyard and being able to eat its fruit. It could also uh, be used as an analogy of judgment, where vineyards are trampled or they plant the vineyards and can't eat of its fruit. And at times in the Old Testament, the vineyard was used to depict the nation of Israel. In fact, I want you to keep your finger in Luke chapter 20 and turn back to Isaiah chapter number 5. Isaiah chapter number 5. And here, God speaking through the prophet Isaiah helps the children of Israel see their unfaithfulness, their lack of obedience to God. And through the prophet Isaiah, this very illustration of a vineyard is used to depict Israel. And in Isaiah chapter 5, he says, beginning in verse 1, Now will I sing to my beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. He fenced it, gathered out the stones, and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it. He also made a wine press, and he looked that it would bring forth grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray, between me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard than what I have done in it? Therefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, why did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, go, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge, and and, uh, it will be eaten up and break down the wall, and it will be trodden down, and I will lay it waste. It will not be pruned nor dug, but there will come up briars and thorns. It will be, I will also command the clouds that they rain, no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry. And so you see that Israel has had a history of disobedience to God. And it's that analogy that Jesus has in mind when he's telling this parable. Uh, It's not an exact correspondence to Isaiah chapter 5, for as we'll discover the kingdom, or the, the vineyard here represents the kingdom of God, but the idea is the same. There's a charge against this current generation of Israelites. Just as the prophet Isaiah brought to Israel, so Jesus now brings to this generation of Israelites. And so we want to uncover, um, as we make our way through this parable, this overall message. And and to do that, uh, I want to look at four different themes that Jesus weaves into this story, into this parable, uh, that will really provide a warning for you and I, a warning not to follow in the footsteps of unbelieving Israel. A warning that we should not do as the children of Israel have done. And so these themes will uh, interrelate with one another, but we want to take the moment to separate them out so that we can see clearly how Jesus uh, powerfully and um, directly warns us. And the first theme that really sums up the nation of Israel and their response to God is the theme of unfaithfulness. Unfaithfulness. And this is very, very clear that Jesus points out in a dramatic and intense sequence of events. And the parable opens up, In verse number 9, a certain man planted a vineyard, and he lent it out 
to husbandmen. These are farmers. These are vine growers. They're people that were hired by the, uh, the owner of the vineyard to tend for the uh, fruit of the vineyard, to make sure that it produces uh, that fruit. Now, now, here in our context, we're familiar with this. Uh, somebody buys a plot of land and then leases that out land out to farmers. And then the farmers come in and they grow crops. And then when it comes time to harvest, they share in some measure, whether it's a percentage or, or whether it's a set fee, they, they share the crop and, and whatever comes from that land. Uh, it can be a very a productive bene- and beneficial relationship for all the parties that are involved. And that's the arrangement that we find in this parable. Uh, the owner of the vineyard uh, lends out his vineyard to farmers, to tenants, to people that are supposed to care for that vineyard. In this parable, the owner represents God. And the farmers or tenants are the leaders of Israel. The leaders of Israel, as we remember, are in one sense representative of the whole nation of Israel, uh, as we've seen in past texts. And so God, in that sense, um, has, uh, has given a responsibility to the leaders of Israel to see that the nation would live in such a way that it would produce fruit. That's the expectation set forth in the parable. When it came time for the harvest, the parable goes, the owner sends one of his servants out to reap a collection or, or reap the portion of his profits. Again, a very common thing. This is what they should expect to happen. When the owner, it comes time for harvest, he's sending out his servant. He's, he's time to collect uh, what he is owed, if you will. And, and that is all very normal for the audience listening. That would be very normal for you and I to think about that way as well. But verse 35, excuse me, um, verse 10 actually introduces what is the most shocking about this parable. When When the servant arrives, the end of verse 10, the farmers beat him. And send him away empty. Now, if you're in the crowd that day, this is shocking to you. They take the servant, the representative of the owner of the vineyard, and they beat him. This is not just kind of a slap upside the face and send him on his way. This is a severe beating, sometimes used to talk about the kind of whipping, you remember the 39 lashes type of whipping that, the, that was common in, in the Jewish time. It was that kind of beating that they put on this servant. He arrives and says, hey, it's time. What kind of profits do you have for the owner? And they proceed to humiliate, beat, and send him away with nothing. That's shocking. How dare These farmers tell the owner of the vineyard, you will not have profit in what you own. Send them away. Empty-handed. That is unthinkable. Immediately, here, you have to be thinking, these are worthless farmers. These are good-for-nothing tenants. They do not meet the expectations the owner has put on them. But verse 11, remarkable. We'll look at this in a moment. Because the owner sends another servant, a second one, to these farmers, to these tenants. Maybe they'll listen to this one. We don't know if these go back to back or not. Or if there's time between them, maybe at the next harvest. But he sends another servant, and they treat him the the same way. They beat him and treat him shamefully and send him away empty-handed. And again, he sent a third. And they wounded him also and cast him out. Time after time, repeatedly, 
the same response from these farmers. These tenants have acted reprehensibly. They deserve to be destroyed. And as we've said, the parable documents the history of Israel. And the servant sent by the landowner represents the prophets who time and time and time again bring the message of the owner to the children of Israel and they are rejected. Over and over again, God sends his prophets to warn his people to call them back from their idolatry, to call them to turn away from the gods that they have given their hearts to and turn back to the living God, the one who has brought them together, the one who has blessed them, the one who has made a covenant with them. And yet time and again, the Old Testament records the children of Israel, beginning with their leaders, reject the prophets. They treat them shamefully. To be a prophet in the Old Testament was not a glamorous job. To be a prophet meant to subject yourself often to insult and to mistreatment. You think of the prophet Jeremiah. Beaten, put in stocks because they didn't like what he said. Thrown into a pit where he sank in the mud and the intention was to leave them there to die, to starve to death. Why? Why? Because he spoke the word of the Lord. That's why. That was it. And the children of Israel, beginning with their leaders, found themselves rejecting the message of God, rejecting his prophets. One thinks of Elijah on the run from wicked kings like Ahab and his wicked, evil wife Jezebel, running for his life because, because the children of Israel, because the leaders wanted to kill him. They have a long line, don't they, of rejecting God's messengers and prove their unfaithfulness to God. But if this was bad enough, to reject the servants and send them back. What what Jesus describes next would have been utterly appalling to the audience and should be to us as well. The owner of the vineyard decides, listen, if they're not paying attention to my servants, then I'm going to send my own son. My beloved son. And if they won't listen to them, then they will surely listen to my beloved son. My only son. And so he sends the son on the way. But when the farmers see the son coming, the plot begins, doesn't it? Ah, there's the son. He's the heir. And if we get rid of him, all of this is ours. We can do what we want. No more answering to this owner. (laughs) We don't have to worry about answering to anybody anymore. We can do what we want with what we have. Let's kill him. Let's get rid of him. When the sun arrives, it says, they seize him. They take him out of the vineyard and they murder him. It's the climax of the unfaithfulness of these wretched farmers. With each servant, the unfaithfulness escalates because they're given further opportunity to make good on the agreement they had with the landowner, but now they have done the unthinkable. They've killed the owner's son. And in a dramatic moment, Jesus predicts his death in just a few short days. He inserts himself into the parable. 
as the beloved son of the landowner. After having sent prophets to warn the nation, in fact, after having asked them the question of the prophet John the Baptist, whether they would believe if he's from heaven or earth, after hearing over and over again the message of the prophets and having rejected it, God sends his son, whom the leaders of Israel would seize and would murder. It's interesting, isn't it? Jesus knows their plot. He predicts their plot. They've been plotting, trying to figure out behind the scenes how they can get rid of Jesus. How they can be rid of this nuisance that they've had affecting them. You can't outright kill them because they're afraid of the people. We see that over and over again. Trying to plot it, but Jesus knows it. No one takes his life. He lays it down of his own accord. And just like in Isaiah, Israel's unfaithfulness is glaringly obvious. If unfaithfulness defines the history of Israel, there's a second theme that is threaded to this, through this parable that actually shines against the backdrop of of their unfaithfulness, and that's God's long-suffering. God's long-suffering. The landowner is generous. Even from the beginning, he's chosen these particular farmers to tend his vineyard, and that's a privilege for them. He set them up into this place to be guardians and stewards of his vineyard. And he trusted them to carry out his will. He has provided everything that they have needed. We read in the passage in Isaiah that he describes how he built a tower and he fenced it in. He provided everything this vineyard needs. In fact, the parallel gospel accounts in Matthew and Mark go into that same detail. Speaking of all that the owner, all that the Lord of the vineyard has done to ensure that his vineyard would be productive. He has set them up for success in every way. That's why Isaiah comments in his his parable, what more has there to do for my vineyard than what I have done in it? So when I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? Essentially, there's nothing more I could have done in the sense that I've set them all up for success, then it is not producing the way that it should produce. That's what's echoed in the question of the landowner in verse 13. What shall I do? What more should I do? Given them everything. All that they could have asked for and more. And yet they're unfaithful. Israel was a nation, a privileged nation, chosen by God from among the nations of the world on whom God would set his covenant love. And it's not because they were mighty or great in number or deserved anything from God, but merely and simply because God was generous and gracious. He gave them everything. Everything they could possibly need to them belonged the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. This is what makes their unfaithfulness all the more shocking. It's committed against the God who bought them, covered their shame, and lavished on them all kinds of blessings. But God is gracious. And His gracious disposition is evident not just in uh, how He set them up and gave them the vineyard, but in His repeated attempts and repeated opportunities that He would give them For them to listen over and over. He sent servants to them. This parable does, in this parable, the landowner does something that really no mere human being would do. You or I, after the first set of servants, comes back whipped, beaten, and empty-handed. We would come to rain judgment, wouldn't we? We would... Deal with these wicked farmers. How dare they? Do they not know who I am? I'll deal with them. 
in the harshest of ways. But God is long-suffering. God is not like us, praise God. He's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, as 2 Peter 3, 9 says. This long-suffering, this patience that the Lord uses in dealing with His people is astonishing and it's costly. It's costly for Him. He's risking the lives of His servant. And such is His patience and such is His long-suffering that He doesn't just send servants, He sends His own beloved Son. great compassion and long-suffering for his people. Isn't it remarkable how patient God is with us? Isn't it remarkable how time and again we go before the throne with the same sins and God is patient? God is long-suffering. Isn't it remarkable that people in this world who hate God live 70, 80, 90 years of pleasure? Isn't it remarkable how patient God is? Isn't it remarkable that not everyone who is born immediately is killed? Isn't it astonishing the patience and long-suffering of our great God? Just as God, with the nation of Israel, showed great long-suffering, so God does that with us today. He gives us more opportunities than we deserve, doesn't he? There does come a time, however, when God's patience comes to an end. And Jesus Ask the question in verse 15, what will the Lord of the vineyard do with these wicked tenants? And the answer to that introduces the third theme of this parable, and that's judgment. Judgment. In Matthew and Mark's gospel, he poses this question to the crowd, and they answer, he will destroy those wretches. And Jesus answers it here. He will come and destroy these farmers, and he will give the vineyard to others. Judgment comes, and that first part of the judgment involves destruction. Destruction of those who have rejected the son. Who have rejected the son of the owner. The nation of Israel experience and will experience this judgment because of their rejection of the Messiah for in short order. It's not just the leaders that are calling for his death, but the crowds who will nail him to a cross for crimes he did not commit. No doubt there will be some among the Israelites that will accept him, the disciples. But as a nation... They have turned their backs on their Messiah. And that's a judgment that comes. And truly that judgment does not just come to Israelites, but to anyone who rejects the Son. On anyone who rejects Jesus as Messiah. Verse 18 says, whoever will fall upon that stone, that stone being Christ, will be broken. But on whomsoever it will fall, it will grind him to powder. It's an image of a devastating judgment. Whether the person falls on the stone and stumbles over the stone, or the stone falls on them to crush them, the result is the same. Judgment. Destruction. Jewish proverb captures the essence of that phrase. It says, If a stone falls on a pot, woe to the pot. If a pot falls on the stone, woe to the pot. In either case, woe to the pot. That's what the idea is here. Those who reject Jesus, the Messiah, 
those who decide to do their own thing, live their own way, be their own boss, be the master of their fate, will find at the end of that road judgment, destruction, wrath of God, hell. This is the judgment that falls, that Jesus says will fall upon the people who have rejected his son. And, and you look back and you say, and that is just. And given the nature of the unfaithfulness and given the nature of God and the one who provides everything, that is absolutely just. It's what they deserve. But we must say in this, the son, the son rejected will one day judge. And Jesus also says to the Israelites that the vineyard would be removed and given to others. He says in verse 16, What will the Lord do? He'll come, he'll destroy the husbandmen, and will give the vineyard to others. We'll give the vineyard to others. Matthew spells out the judgment in a little more detail. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 43 Matthew says, therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. Matthew helps us a little bit here. See, this vineyard that is to be given represents the kingdom of God that will be given to a nation that will produce its fruits. See, we've seen this repeatedly throughout Luke's gospel The children of Israel had assumed the kingdom of God was theirs. Theirs because of heritage. Theirs because they were Israelites. And that was especially true of the leaders of Israel, the Sanhedrin. To them, they assumed belonged the kingdom. But Jesus says, the kingdom of God is not gained by one's heritage. The kingdom of God is determined by one's relation to Jesus. These individuals had rejected the Son of God, so they would not be part of the kingdom. They would forfeit their place in the kingdom of God. Why? Because they rejected the way, the truth, and the life. Because they rejected the only one that could get them there. They had turned him away. They had killed him, or they would kill him. Therefore, they could not belong to the kingdom of God. That's a devastating judgment. And Jesus says this this kingdom would be given to others. Namely, others would come to have access to the kingdom that that they would assume should not. I think Luke is talking about the Gentiles. Others would come into this kingdom. Those who were on the outside looking in. As Paul would say, those who were strangers to the promises. They would now have access to the kingdom. And this comes as no surprise to the readers of Luke's gospel although it did come as a surprise to the leaders and the people that were listening at that day. This comes as no surprise to us by the time we're in chapter 20 of Luke's gospel because this has been Luke's theme. This is one of the things that Luke has pressed into us constantly throughout the 20 chapters that we have studied. In fact, Jesus explicitly taught this back in chapter 13 when he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I will tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able to enter. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, he will answer, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, but we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. Essentially, surely we know you. Surely you know us. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac 
and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourself cast out. And people will come from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south, and will recline at table in the kingdom of God. It's no surprise to Luke's readers that Gentiles, others, will gain access to the kingdom because access to the kingdom comes only through the Son, Jesus Christ. And anyone who comes to the Son, anyone who comes to God through Jesus Christ has access to the kingdom. So the kingdom is taken away from them. Why? Because they have rejected the only way of salvation. This judgment is pronounced on the nation of Israel. And it doesn't mean that the nation is removed forever. The rejection of Christ, his crucifixion, introduces a partial hardening upon the nation of Israel. A time Luke 21, 24 calls the time of the Gentiles. And the redemptive plan of God, the kingdom, was going to be extended beyond just Israel to the Gentile world. And the Bible does record there is a day coming when the nation of Israel returns to God and puts their faith in their Messiah, Jesus Christ. The hardening will lift and they will look on him whom they have pierced. But for the present generation, their hold on the kingdom of God is removed and the kingdom extended to the Gentiles. And it's this statement that draws from the crowd this expression, God forbid. God forbid. May it never be that this would happen. Luke introduces, I think, here, at the beginning of this antagonism of the crowd towards Jesus. They're in disbelief. How? How could the kingdom be given to others? It's ours. It's ours by right. And Jesus says, oh no. You've been unfaithful. It's only to those who come through the Son. May it never be. They recognize what Jesus is saying. They understand the judgment he is calling down upon them. And that judgment is coming because of the Son, Jesus Christ. And that really brings us to the final theme that describes the message of this parable, and that's the theme of exaltation. Jesus concludes this parable. And he looks at the crowd in verse 17 and says, What is it then that is written, the stone that the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? You want to know why entrance into the kingdom all revolves around Jesus? Jesus says, because God has exalted the Son. Because God has exalted the Son. He has ordained that all that come into the kingdom, must come through the Son. Jesus quotes a familiar passage to the readers of Luke already from Psalm chapter 118. Already Luke has talked to us twice about this psalm. Verse 26, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, connected to the Messiah. But now Jesus goes a few verses earlier in the psalm to quote from verse 22. The stone that the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. Jesus explains to them, the son who in the parable is rejected by the people of Israel is exalted by God. He's exalted by God. You see, the people of Israel may have attempted to kill him. They, they have killed him. They've attempted to get rid of him. But, but Jesus tells us that that's not the end of the story. It's the end of the parable, but it's not the end of the story. Because that same son that was cast away by man does not remain dead. The Lord raises him up. And he lifts him up to become the cornerstone. 
The leaders of Israel did not see anything extraordinary in Jesus. They only saw a threat to them and their idols. They only saw this man that claimed to be speaking from God. And when they sized him up, the leaders and ultimately the nation of Israel size up Jesus. They look at him as a stone that doesn't fit their plans and they reject him. He doesn't fit. He doesn't come in and kind of meld into what we already have going. He, he, he assumes that he can come in and call the shots. By what authority are you doing this? He assumes that he's the guy that we all have to listen to. That's their assessment of Jesus. He doesn't fit into the structure. We, we're going to get rid of him. But it's our structure we're trying to fit him into. It's their evaluation of Jesus. He didn't fit their plans. They never stopped to ask if they were fitting into God's or not. And God's evaluation, Jesus tells us, is completely the opposite. Jesus, in fact, is not just a stone that fits into the plan. He is the cornerstone. He is the foundation of the entire structure. He holds it all together. He guides it all. He's not just a part. He's the most important foundation. Kingdom of God built on the foundation of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why. That's why everyone who desires to enter the kingdom must come through him. Because God has set him as the cornerstone. The exalted son. And this exalted status as the cornerstone gives him the authority to become the righteous judge. That's what 18 is all about. He is the righteous judge because everything is on him. Those who fall on him will be break, broken. <clears throat> and on whomsoever he falls, they will be ground to powder. Luke later puts this same reality into the lips of of the apostles in Acts chapter 17, 30 and 31, where he says, the time of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people <coughs> everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Jesus is that man. Jesus is the one by whom God will judge the world. Why? Because the Father, God, has raised him as exalted cornerstone. Given him authority over everything, a name which is above every name. So for those who do not believe, <clears throat> for those who reject Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life, Judgment is coming. They will experience the harsh reality when Jesus returns to judge the living and the dead. It's critical to know this morning that your place in the kingdom of God is determined by your response to Jesus. Uh, that's the most critical piece of information that you will ever need to know. Your place in the kingdom of God. How do you know? Do you know whether you will arrive in the kingdom of God? Is it by your heritage? No? Is it because you come from Christian parents? No? Christian grandparents? No? Because your dad, your grandpa was a preacher? No? Is it because you come to church regularly? No? Is it because you give in the offering regularly? No? Is it because you volunteer in charity works? No. Your place in the kingdom of God is not 
determined by any of those things. Your place in the kingdom of God is determined by your response to Jesus, the Messiah. And here's what God says in his word so very, very clearly. That your, that your nature, your response is just like the ones of the farmers. That's what you are by nature in this parable. That, that you will respond to a benevolent and good God that has given you everything that you could ever need. In hatred, that's how you'll respond to him. Because that's how you are infected by the sin of your heart. You'll reject him. You will hate him. You will want to live your own way, call your own shots. This is the human nature. Listen, all, all, all we're seeing it right now, this craziness that's happened in the world, that's just human nature exposing itself that's what that is and that same human nature is inside of you it may be more cleaned up it might look prettier on the outside but it's just as sinister on the inside and it will lead you to hell because that's your nature that's what you will do that's how you will respond and the kind of visceral response you have to the kind of farmers in this parable is a right kind of response, they should be destroyed, but you need to know that's the kind of visceral response that we have to our own hearts, that we should have, and that God has to our hearts. We should be destroyed. We deserve it. But God is patient, and he's long-suffering, and he's given you opportunity to turn. He's given you opportunity to repent. No matter how many times you've heard this same truth, he's giving you another one, another chance another opportunity because God is long-suffering. He doesn't owe you another opportunity. But in his mercy, he's providing it for you to turn from your sin, to leave it behind and to turn to his son who died in your place, who died on a cross, shedding his blood for the forgiveness of your sins. And he rose again to be exalted by the Father as the cornerstone. And if you would come to him in that kind of trust, in that kind of commitment, laying your life, surrendering completely to him, he will save you, he will forgive you, he will bring you into the kingdom of God. There is no other way than that. God is patient. But judgment is coming. The time is short. No matter how long you've lived, 20, 30, 40, 80 years, God has given you more than what you deserve and he doesn't owe you another day more and he doesn't owe that to me either. And we don't know when we step into eternity and stand before Jesus the judge. And if you have not trusted Jesus, the judgment that he describes here will come upon you destroyed. The question begs for you, what will you do with Christ? Christian, this parable helps us see two characteristics of God as two of the themes that are <clears throat> critical for us to keep in mind as well. God is patient. God is also just. God is patient and God is also just. Most of us will struggle in one way or another in our Christian life to live out this belief and this uh, understanding that God is patient and God is just. Because here's what we're we're, we're going to tend to do as Christians. We're either going to fall onto the side that forgets that God is long-suffering and we're going to be paralyzed in our guilt. We're going to be paralyzed in our guilt. Or we're going to fall on the other side of things and over-abuse the patience of God 
We forget that God also is just. And we're going to presume upon his kindness and justify our sin. That's typical for the Christian life. The patience of God is a welcome relief to weary Christians, isn't it? We're battling sin. We're struggling. We know our hearts. We are prone to stray away from God. And we wonder, don't we? We wonder if God is getting tired of us. If God is just getting tired of the same old thing. And we are striving and we're fighting, but we're not doing as well as we'd like. We know we don't always hit the mark. And we wonder, is God weary of me? Maybe you wonder, does God regret saving me? But our God is patient. And he's gracious. He's long-suffering with us. He pursues us. He calls us. He shepherds us. Where you and I might be tempted to cast people like us away and just say, ah, be rid of them. God doesn't. He calls us back to himself over and over again because God is not like us. But if we don't catch this, Christian, if we don't understand this, we will struggle in our walk. We will walk uneasily instead of confidently in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We will expect God to be hiding around every corner waiting for us to mess up just so he can get us. And if that's the picture you have of God, you haven't quite applied the gospel well to your life. You haven't understood all the ramifications of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have forgotten that God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So when you forget that, what you'll do is when you sin, you will run away from God in fear instead of run to him for forgiveness. You'll assume, well, I got to go get cleaned up a little bit. I got to do a few right things so that God is happy with me again before I can go to him. You'll wallow in your grief. You'll sink in despair. You'll try all sorts of other things to ease your guilt, like forgive yourself. Instead of going to God, as though we have the authority to forgive ourselves, but we'll try all kinds of crazy things. Or maybe you'll try to punish yourself because you fail to remember, to remember that God is patient and long-suffering towards you. When you sin, however, God is ready to forgive. But you might also fall onto the other side and presume upon the kindness of God. I mean, you believe that God is patient, but you forget that God is also just. As Christians, we will not face the danger of condemnation to be crushed under the cornerstone. That, that's not for the believer. Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is a glorious, marvelous, wonderful truth. But the Lord, we will give an account to him for how we lived our life. That also is true. The Lord disciplines those whom he loves. That is true. And we must bear that in mind as well. And perhaps you're, instead of kind of being paralyzed in your grief, perhaps you use the patience of God as an excuse to keep on sinning. You neglect striving after holiness. Why? Because you pass off your sin as though it's not really that big of a deal. You're not broken over your sin. You're not grieved over your sin. Well, God will forgive me. It's okay. You presume upon his kindness like Romans 2, 4 says? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? You need to remember the holiness of God. Where do you tend to fall? 
It's a question to wrestle with this week, isn't it? Do you tend to fall? Believing that God is patient with your sin? Maybe getting to fail to believe that God is patient with your sin and maybe being paralyzed by grief? Or, or do you f- often fall on presuming upon God's long suffering? Jesus is the cornerstone. The people's evaluation of Jesus was a stone that didn't fit into their plans. But God exalted him and expects everybody to fit into his. And all of that centers around Jesus Christ. How do you order your life? How do you order your priorities? What competes with Christ in your life? Maybe it's sports or kids or career or money or leisure. Is Christ calling the shots in your life? Does your assessment of Jesus match God's assessment of Jesus? The Lord has given us a clear illustration of what unfaithfulness looks like in the nation of Israel, hasn't he? And he's warning us not to presume upon God's patience and his kindness because judgment will come if we reject the exalted cornerstone. Don't let this warning pass you by this morning. Listen to Jesus and receive the blessings of his promises. Let's pray together. Father, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And it has shown the way again this morning for us. And like so many opportunities now, and like so many times before, we have an opportunity to respond to it. Father, I know that we cannot respond well to this truth. In fact, we cannot respond to embrace this truth unless your spirit does his work. And I ask, Father, if there's any among us that today this message has pierced their heart to the point that they have realized they do not have a part in the kingdom of God because they have rejected your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I ask that your spirit would grant to them the mercy of repentance and faith that today might be the day they turn from darkness to light. Father, and I ask for those among us that that wrestle with this, that struggle with presuming upon your kindness or forget your patience and long-suffering and choose instead to try to figure out our own way. I pray, Father, that you would move us toward the cornerstone, your Son, Jesus Christ. That our hearts would be tender and soft. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace that's so evident to us in Jesus Christ. Forgive us, Father. In Christ's name we pray.